All right, if you are. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Emily. I am the Public Outreach Coordinator at Addison County Solid Waste Management District, and this is... Hi, my name is Gabby. I'm the AmeriCorps member of the Addison Solid Waste Management District. So, welcome to Managing Recyclables in Addison County. Briefly, what we're going to cover today is an overview of how recycling works here, how you can help recycling work, some do's and don'ts of recycling, the special materials that are required to be separated out from landfill waste by Vermont law. And at the end, we will have a Q&A session. So you might mainly know us from the district transfer station that we operate here in Middlebury. Um, this is where we do take most trash and recycling in Addison County. We don't take anything directly from residents, but if you use a town drop off or hire a hauler, most of that waste comes to us here. In Vermont, we have something special, which is Act 148, or the Universal Recycling Law. And what this did is it mandated the separation of recycling from trash. So we are legally required to separate out all of your recycling from your trash materials. Now with recycling, there is some confusing terminology. So I'm just going to clarify here some words that we'll use throughout the presentation. So we refer to a lot as blue bin recycling, and what that is, is all the commingled materials that you can put in a bin just like that, that blue bin. The bin doesn't necessarily have to be blue, um, but it's any of your curbside recycling. We also have special materials, which are products that can be recycled, but they can't go in that blue bin. So that might be because they're hazardous or just because they don't interact well with the facility that sorts our recycling, but they need to be collected in a separate stream. That's most of the items that you can bring to the district transfer station. So recycling is a global market, and that means that changes that happen in the recycling markets in China or in any other country can have an actual effect on how we recycle here in Addison County. So recycling is not universal, and it really depends on the markets, um, the machinery that we have, and also the infrastructure that we've built around recycling in that particular county. So it's always a good idea to check up on the guidelines for recycling materials pretty frequently just to see what's been changed. Um, also, materials and packaging can sometimes change quite often, so something that was previously made from a recycled material today might not necessarily be recyclable tomorrow. So a great example is these two Febreze cans. Um, one is made from aluminum, like a typical aerosol spray can is, and the other, when you look at the bottom, you can see it's been made out of plastic, which is a different material. So that being said, even though it's tricky, why is it so important that we recycle? Environmentally, recycling reduces the amount of waste that we send to landfills. Um, you may be aware that we've got one active landfill in Vermont at the moment, and that's the Coventry Landfill. Um, it's only got about 20 years left before it becomes entirely full, and so making sure that we recycle as much as possible is a great way to save space in that landfill for all of the non-recyclable materials. It also prevents pollution from traditional disposal and it conserves natural resources. Economically, it can save energy compared to producing materials for raw virgin sources. And it moves us towards what we call a more circular economy, which creates less waste and is a better long-term strategy. Socially, it creates more jobs to recycle than to put all of your waste in a landfill. And as long as you're recycling correctly, you can create a safer working environment for those employees. So I'm not sure if you're aware, um, but we have a term called MRF. It stands for Materials Recovery Facility. Sometimes it's also called a Materials Recycling Facility. Both are correct. Um, but this is where all of the actual recycling gets sorted. So here in Addison County, at the district transfer station, not too far, we collect and aggregate those materials, and then we send them to the MRF that's located in Rutland. If you were in a county a little bit further north, it would be sent to Williston instead. Um, but those are the only two MRFs in Vermont, and that's where everything gets sorted and sent out to other markets in the United States and abroad. Um, so things that are not meant to be recycled but are put in your bin are referred to as contamination. And contamination is, it reduces the value of recyclables overall, um, it reduces the efficiency of recycling, but it can also increase the cost of recycling. 
And so it's important to keep in mind that there are real employees who are sorting through all of your recyclables. And when you have contamination in your recycling bin, you can make their job a lot dirtier, but also a little bit less safe, which we don't want. So now that we explained after the blue bin, it comes to us and then goes to Rutland, you might wonder, okay, so what about after the MRF? Where does it get sold to? So our MRF uh, is operated by Casella, and they were kind enough to share with us some of the items and where they go and what they get turned into. So we have over here HDPE number two plastic. So that's going to be your jugs, kind of similar to this, your milk jugs, um, your laundry detergent is also, also going to be that. This becomes plastic bottles and drainage piping for road construction in Alabama or Pennsylvania. Your steel will become metal parts for cars in Canada. Your mixed paper is going to become some cardboard or pulp in New York and Quebec. Your PP number five plastic, this will become paint cans and this gets shipped to Alabama. Your PET number one plastic, this becomes plastic bottles, fleece or carpeting and this gets shipped to Canada and other parts of the US. Your aluminum becomes new aluminum, soda or beer cans in Alabama. Your cardboard becomes more cardboard in New York and Canada and your glass becomes fiberglass or other construction materials in Canada. And we show this to show it, what you recycle, it won't always become exactly what you put into the blue bin, but it will become a new item. So now that you know a little bit about what happens to our recycling, where it goes, what it becomes, you might wonder how do we keep this working? There are a lot of things you can do to keep this system working. So the first thing that you can do is make the conscious choice to buy items made from recycled materials. So brands pay very close attention. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Buying recycled seems pretty easy. Um, but if you've ever tried to buy an environmentally friendly product in a store, you might have noticed that there are a lot of different labels and lots of different terms like green and earth friendly and non-polluting, um, which can have varying meanings and sometimes no meanings at all. Um, so the same thing can be applied to buying a product made from recycled materials. That being said, there are two very good logos to look out for. Um, they're both third-party certified. The first one is called a PCR label, and the second is called a PIR label. So PCR stands for post-consumer recycled, and that is what you would traditionally think of when it comes to recycling. That's when you put something in your blue bin, it comes to us at a transfer station, we send it to a MRF, and then they send it to other markets who produce new products from it. Um, PIR recycled, that is mostly good business on top of being more environmentally friendly. It's when a manufacturer takes the scraps or the items that they can no longer use in the manufacturing process and they resend it back to a recycler before it even hits the consumers so that they can get the value back for those materials. The next thing you can do is choose to buy recyclable items. That's items you know can be put in your blue bin. So brand owners pay very close attention to their consumers and they pay attention to what consumers say that they want and then also what they do. So when consumers try to make the conscious effort to buy items that they know can be put in their blue bin before, um, brands will pay attention to that and they will start to make an effort to create packaging that is more recyclable. So if possible, when you're buying an item, try asking yourself if it can go in your blue bin before you purchase it, just to see. Um, the ideal material to be recycled is made from a single easily identifiable material like glass, metal, or even any type of plastic, um, or it can be made from more than one material that's very easy to separate from each other. So a great example is the yogurt container that's in the center of the screen. Um, once you're done with your lunch, you can take the aluminum top off and take the glass bottom, rinse them both out, and they can both go in your blue bin. Um, you can opt for paper that doesn't have additional coatings. This is stuff like glitter, foil, wax, um, or plastic. Or you, can or you can opt for plastics that you know can be put in your blue bin. So these are very common items like water bottles, milk jugs, or detergent bottles. You can, oh, the other way you can help is by recycling what you can, but that might be hard to do if you don't know exactly what is and is not recyclable. 
So in order to do this step, we're going to go through some do's and don'ts of blue bin recycling. So as I said earlier, we do have mandatory recyclables in the state of your Vermont. This is your paper, your number one and two plastic, your metal, and your glass. There are some exceptions in all of these categories, and we will go through that in a minute. And there are some rules to follow, the biggest one being on the screen here. Everything needs to be empty, clean, and dry in order to go in your blue bin. We do have some other rules to remember, though, that are specific to Addison County. So we have the rule of two, which is about the size constraints of what can go in your blue bin. Everything has to be larger than two inches and smaller than two feet. We have the three Fs, which is no film, no foam, and no food. For glass, we are going to want to take lids off of items. And for plastic, we're going to want to put lids on. It's going to be mainly plastic containers and packaging that go in your blue bin. Uh, we don't want any durable plastics. We'll get into all of this a little bit on. But again, we always want to say everything has to always be clean and dry. So we have these rules and we know the types of materials that we want to recycle. But when you look at items, you're typically just met with labels that look like this. So those three arrows with a number in the middle, it's referred to as the chasing arrow symbol or it's the resin code of an item. This doesn't really determine recyclability. While there are resin codes that have a higher recyclability than other, all the resin code really tells you is the type of material your item is made of. So number one and two is our mandatory recyclables in the state of Vermont. But I would like to point out within the one and two, there are items that can't be recycled because they don't meet the rules. And outside of the one and two, there are items that are entirely able to go in your blue bin. So we want to say, always look at the item you have in your hand See if it meets the rules. If it does meet the rules, then you can absolutely put it in your blue bin. The other type of label you might see is the how to recycle label here. And what this one does is it separates out what you have into its packaging component, the type of material that packaging component is made of. At the top, it tells you if there's any prep needed before you can recycle the item. And in the center here, that is the recyclability. So the chasing arrows here with a slash through it, that means that it is trash. That item can't go in your blue bin. The just regular chasing arrow recycling symbol without anything, that is how to recycle's widely recycled label. And I would just like to point out here that the widely recycled label is given to products that are recyclable for 60% of Americans. And I'd like to focus on that number, 60%. That's not that high. Uh, so again, always look at the item yourself, and if you're confused on whether it can be recycled or not, always check your local guidelines or ask us a question. We also have the store drop-off label. Um, what this means is it's typically indicative of a special material, so something that can be recycled but can't go in your blue bin. And this plastic bag here is a great example. We do have a plastic bag and film program at the district transfer station. So you can save up your plastic bags and bring them to us, but your plastic bags can't go in your blue bin. So now that we talked about labels a bit, we can get into specific products. So for your paper, this is what can go in your blue bin. This is your regular office paper, your envelopes. You can even leave the plastic windows in the envelopes. Uh, your frozen food boxes, your cardboard, your paper bags, your magazines, your newspaper, your tissue paper, not tissue paper, your tissue boxes, yeah, that's what I meant to say, like this. This is absolutely fine to go in. Uh, just break it down. However, for some paper items, certain criteria does apply, and that's for things like wrapping paper and greeting cards. So anything like that that has a coating on it, so if it has plastic covering it, if there's glitter, if there's cellophane, if there's a little musical device inside, um, if there's ribbons, anything that has mixed materials like that from the card, that makes the card unrecyclable. So if you want to recycle your cards, you're gonna make, wanna make sure it is uncoated and it's just a plain old card, and that can absolutely go in your blue bin. And then for shredded paper, this is a pretty big exception. 
Shredded paper is actually the only item that you should put in your blue bin in a bag. So and in that bag, it does have parameters. All bags have to be completely clear and able to tie shut. And it should also be colorless. This is so that when the bag arrives at the MRF, the workers can see that it's shredded paper in there and remove it and put it into the shredded paper stream. And then for books and magazines, what is blue bin recyclable for that is your paperback books and your magazines only. Hardcover books can't go in your blue bin. We do have a special material program though at the district transfer station for hardcover books. So you can always bring them to us. Again, where certain criteria applies is for frozen food and pizza boxes. So your frozen food boxes are absolutely okay to go in your blue bin. What's not okay from the frozen food aisle is ice cream cartons. Cartons aren't recyclable in Addison County because they often have a film of either wax or plastic on the inside. And then for pizza boxes, uh, this one has an exception of if there's a little grease, it is okay. But if there's too much grease that makes the pizza box soggy or there's stuff on food, then it would not be recyclable because that would count as food contamination. So a pizza box like this, there's only a couple little stains of grease. That would be okay to go in your blue bin, but anything dirtier than that wouldn't be. And then for metal, this is what goes in. So your aluminum foil and your yogurt tops that are aluminum are absolutely fine. And for this, you might notice that there's a ball of aluminum on the screen. We also have one here. So with this, you're going to want to make sure that it meets the size requirements. A lot of you might run into aluminum that's smaller than two inches. I know I do. So what I do with that is I just start creating a ball until it's about two inches in size. How I know that is I compare it to the size of my fist. If it's about the size of my fist, then I know it meets the MRF specs and I can just toss this in the blue bin. Aluminum high plates and trays are also fine. If you really want, you can crush it up like this uh, just to make it easier, but you can put that in flat as well. Um, aluminum cans are absolutely fine, same as steel pans. And a little hack for this is if you have a can and you remove the top entirely from it, you can put the lid back inside of the can and kind of divot in the edges just to make sure that that lid doesn't fall out. And then this makes it just one material, it's easy to move through the MERS stream because if you have that flat lid by itself, it might move through the MRF the same as a piece of plastic like this. So it just eliminates the contamination. And then what is surprising for some people is some aerosols are absolutely okay to put in your blue bin. For this example, uh, you're just wanna, wanna make sure it is completely empty. And how you tell that is if you press down on this and you don't hear any noise, there's no substances coming out, no air, it's empty. And then you're also going to want to make sure the aerosol didn't contain anything hazardous. So our specs for that is if, if it's an aerosol that contains something you can eat or something you can put on yourself, then it's fine to go in your blue bin because that's not hazardous. So whipped cream is absolutely fine, same as hairspray or other dry shampoos. And then for glass, this is what can go in. So it's going to be your single use products like your mason jars, your jelly jars, your salsa jars, any juice that comes in a glass container, your wine bottles, your beer bottles, all of this can go in your blue bin. The one thing we do say for glass is that you're going to want to take the lids and caps off. If you have a lid that is greater than two inches in any two dimensions, it can go in the blue bin by itself. But if you have a plastic cap that's smaller than two inches, it can't go in the blue bin. And then I do want to mention here corks as well. Corks are not blue bin recyclable, but we do have a special material program for them at the district transfer station. So you can collect your corks and bring them to us. And then for plastic, which is really confusing, this is what can go in the blue bin. It's going to be your single use plastic containers and packaging. So that is your clamshell containers, your takeout containers, your bottles, your cups, your yogurt containers, your laundry detergents, caps that you come from coffee. Um, this all can go in. 
And the rule for plastic that's different than glass is you're going to want to keep the lids and caps on. That's because a lot of the caps for plastic bottles, they're smaller than two inches. So if you put the cap back on, that just makes sure that the lid and cap make it through the MRF and it's sorted correctly. So for plastic, there are a lot of areas where certain criteria applies. Again, with the caps, um, if you have caps that are smaller than two inches, please attach them back onto your plastic bottle. If you have caps that are larger than two inches, they can go in the bin loose, or you can attach them back if you really want to. What's surprising is five gallon buckets. Uh, those are actually recyclable because most of them are smaller than two feet. So to recycle that, you just have to make sure that you clean the pails and lids and you remove the metal handles. The metal handle can come to the district transfer station as scrap metal, but the rest of that can just be put in your blue bin. And then here is where we really want to stress food containers need to be clean. We don't want any food. Um, there are real people who sort your recycling and if there's any food, it can get moldy and smelly and it just makes their working environment less safe, unpleasant. So we ask everything clean. The peanut butter that is shown here in this slide, this would not be blue bin recyclable because it has too much peanut butter on it. You're going to want to really make sure you have a clean container. So another way that you can get the most out of your recyclables is to refrain from recycling what you can't recycle. Um, so we have a term, it's called wish cycling. And wish cycling is when you put something in your blue recycling bin that cannot be recycled because you either feel bad about throwing it away, so you throw it in there, or you put it in because you think maybe someone will figure out how to recycle it, so I'll just toss it in. Um, but this just creates a lot more contamination. So I'm just going to return to two slides that Emily had showed before. Um, like we said, in Addison County, we really don't go by resin code because there are some more traditional resin codes that have a few exceptions of non-recyclable items. And the reverse is also true. There are some resin codes that are less likely to be recycled but can be recycled. Uh, so for example, under two, um, under the code two, there are cosmetics and plastic bags. Um, so plastic bags should never go in your blue recycling bin, but we can take them to the district transfer station if you bring them to our special recycling program. And cosmetics generally are quite small. Um, so they tend to be a bit smaller than two inches. They can have multiple layers of metal or different types of plastics or mirrors overlapping each other. And they can also have contamination from the cosmetic product. If you have a squeeze bottle, for example, they can't be fully cleaned. Um, so this is just to show that there's always exceptions, and so it's a good idea to really take a look at the product that you're putting in your blue bin and not rely so much on the resin code. So back to the how to recycle label that Emily had mentioned. Um, like Emily said, when an item is deemed recyclable by how to recycle, that means that it's recyclable in 60% of the counties in the United States, which is a pretty low number. Um, so you always want to double check and make sure with your county that an item is recyclable first. Um, however, I would say that if you have an item that has a slash through it, meaning that it's not recyclable, that's a good indication. It probably can't go in your bin and you can leave it out. Um, but that's just another way to tell. So now we're going to go into a few don'ts, some items that should not go in your blue bin and what you can do with them. Um, this is primarily going to be foam products, uh, plastic films, and then also some items that just don't meet the specifications that we've required. So to start, we have something called a durable item. So the durable item can make up a wide variety of products, but mostly it's going to be different plastics or plastics plus another material bonded together in a way that they can't be separated. Um, so this can be anything from a child's toy to a lawn chair to a tool to something like a water bottle like this, which is metal at the bottom but has multiple layers of plastic on top. Um, so just remember that what we're really looking for in your bins are going to be primarily containers and packaging. Um, so these are going to be items that are made from one or a few materials that's very easy to break down or separate. Um, but if you do find yourself with items like this that are considered durable goods, the best thing to do with them would be to donate them if possible or to throw them in the trash when they're no longer usable. So next we're going to talk a little bit about compostable and plant-based plastics. 
Um, so these are items like these two cups here. Um, compostable products are designed to biodegrade, whereas plant-based plastics are made from corn or another kind of natural material that has been turned into a plastic item. Um, so chemically, these are different from plastics. Usually plastic cups like this are made from a number one, for example, plastic. Um, and so you really can't blend these together with other actual plastic items to make something new. Um, they can actually look nearly identical to a regular plastic cup or item, so it can be very difficult to sort them out. But you can always check the bottom and look for the letters PLA, which is a good way to know that it's not uh, a number one plastic. Um, you can also look for words like biodegradable, compostable, made from corn, made from plants. Um, that will just tell you that it's not the same chemically as a regular plastic cup. If you do find yourself with a biodegradable or compostable product that is safe for home compost, you're welcome to put it in. Um, but other than that, these would also be trash. So next we have small items. Small items like utensils or straws can fall through cracks in the recycling equipment and become a hazard. Um, these are anything that doesn't follow the two inches by two inches rule. Um, they can also cause contamination because these little items can fall inside of larger recyclable items and follow them along for the ride and they get mixed up where they shouldn't be. Um, so the best thing to do would be to reduce your use of small single-use plastics if possible. Um, make sure to put the caps on your plastic bottles. Um, but other than that, these items are always going to have to be in the trash. So next we have oil and hazardous fluid containers. So this can be anything from motor oil and automotive chemicals to certain cleaning products, pool chemicals, anything that's labeled as caustic or corrosive on the bottle. Um, so we at Addison County have a year-round hazardous waste facility not too far from here at the district transfer station. So if ever you have a full or partially full container of something like this, you're more than welcome to bring it to us and we'll take care of it for you. Um, but if you have an empty bottle of something that used to contain a hazardous waste that's caustic or corrosive, um, then that cannot go in your recycling bin. A lot of the residue is still going to be on that packaging and you don't want to clean it out because of course the wastewater from washing it will go down your drain where you don't want those chemicals to end up. Um, but those kinds of products that used to hold hazardous waste will have to go in your trash. Oh, so not a special recycling? If they're empty, not special recycling. But if they're full or even a little bit full, you can take it to us at the transfer station. So next we have styrofoam. Styrofoam is known as expanded polystyrene. Um, so it is technically, in some cases, recyclable, but it requires very specialized machinery and something called a critical mass of material, which is just an extremely high volume of material, which is something that Addison County doesn't have. Um, so as a result, we are not able to recycle uh, styrofoam in Addison County. So it would always have to be trash. If you have something like packing peanuts and you would like to get rid of them without putting them in the garbage, you can always try calling your local UPS or FedEx and see if they are accepting packing peanuts for reuse, because sometimes they are. Um, but if not, those will have to be trash as well. Okay. So we talk about this a lot, but plastic bags and films are something that we call tanglers. This is because they get tangled up in a lot of the equipment. They can cause the equipment to need to stop or shut down if there's too much of it. And the MRFs can sometimes be shut down multiple times a day just to pause and remove all the tanglers from the equipment. Um, so always make sure to keep your recyclables loose in a blue bin like what you have in front of you. Um, never put your plastic bags, never put your recycling in plastic bags or trash bags. Um, because that will also get tangled up in the equipment. Um, and if you don't have a recycling bin, you can always use a cardboard box or even a paper bag, but they should never ever go in plastic. Um, the transfer station has a plastic film program. Um, also, lots of grocery stores have plastic film programs if that's more convenient for you. But if you can't dispose of your plastic bags and film that way, they would have to go in the trash. So this is an example of exactly what I had spoken about. This is a machine called the Star Discs. Um, they turn as a way to sort out paper and other light recyclables, but as you can see, it's had to stop because there are so many plastic bags tangled up in the equipment, 
And every time this happens, they have to shut down the equipment and one or two employees will have to go in with box cutters and manually cut out all of the bags until it's safe to restart the machine again. Um, so I'm sure you can imagine this is quite dangerous and we would rather them not have to do this multiple times a day. Um, so keeping the plastic bags out is the first step to making sure that's the case. Um, but it's not just plastic bags. There are other items called tanglers that should never be put in your blue bin, and that can include things like rope, um, hoses, uh, ribbon, and also clothing. Um, even though we accept clothing at the district transfer, transfer station for special recycling, it shouldn't go in your blue bin because things like pants or even just scraps of fabric will get tangled in the equipment. So this is a couple of different items in one slide, um, but this is mostly cartons, food packaging, and also things like napkins. Um, so in general, a carton is made from multiple layers. Usually it's going to be plastic or paper at the very least, but sometimes with items that are made to be shelf stable, there will also be an added layer of metal. And whether it's plastic and paper or plastic, paper, and metal, they're not really recyclable from each other, or I apologize, they're not separatable from each other, which means that they're not recyclable. So they can't be taken apart. Um, the same goes for a lot of food containers, like takeout containers, for example, where the plastic or the wax coating can't be taken off, so they can't actually get to the specific paper material that they're trying to recycle. Um, in the case of things like napkins, but also in the case of tissue paper or paper towels, whether they're clean or they're dirty, they're just too thin. And so even though it's pure paper, it can't be recycled because they don't go through the Merck equipment, so they can't be sorted out. I, on your website, it, I looked up tissue paper, you know, like wrapping, you know, that you use for gift. Mm -hmm. that, that can be recycled. If yeah. it's like a, um, a hard tissue paper, like what you would put in a gift, that, that can be because it's a bit thicker. Um, what I'm talking about is more like Kleenex tissues. Oh. Yeah. That was a good question, though. Um, next, even though we're all familiar with glass being recycled, uh, mason jars, jelly jars, wine bottles, those are all things that can go in your blue bin, but there are some glass lookalikes that cannot be recycled. Um, that's mostly going to be things like Pyrex mirrors, uh, window panes, um, or even picture frame glass. That can't be recycled because it is chemically different from what would be put into a plastic bottle. Um, so these are usually made to be shatter resistant, UV resistant, or even microwavable. Um, so th that kind of uh, that kind of glass, when it's shredded, does not work with the glass made from consumer packaging. And then finally, the last thing we would prefer you don't put in your blue bins, or you can't put in your blue bins, is products that we already have special recycling programs for. This can be things like paint or hazardous waste, batteries, CFL light bulbs, or propane tanks. Um, these are things that we have special recycling programs for. They can't go in your blue bin because they may be dangerous, but they're also banned from landfill. So you can't throw them out in your trash either. Um, that's why we have set up programs at the district transfer station specifically for these items. We also have a program specifically for scrap metal, although that's not technically banned from landfill. You're more than welcome to bring things like pots or pans um, to us there. So the last way to keep recycling working is by supporting extended producer responsibility, also known as EPR. So extended producer responsibility, it's sometimes referred to as product stewardship. And what this does is it's legislation that makes it the manufacturer's responsibility to pay for the eventual disposal of their items. So right now our system mainly operates where the manufacturers, they don't pay any disposal costs. Those costs instead fall on consumers, municipalities, recycling centers, the people who actually handle the waste at its end of life. EPR makes it more cost effective by kind of splitting that cost across all the people who are involved in that product's lifespan. And it makes it manufacturers, they do have to pay for disposal and it makes them think about disposal. In Vermont, we do currently have five EPR programs. So this is all of your batteries, uh, your mercury containing thermostats, your electronic waste, your mercury containing lamps, which is the light bulbs, um, and your paint. There are eight laws. Um, there might be more to come with this, uh, time will only tell. 
but people are constantly working on EPR laws and EPR programs. How we compare to the rest of the nation is we're actually doing pretty well. We come in third with the amount of EPR laws. So we have eight laws. Uh, Maine has nine laws, and California has 11 EPR laws. So you might wonder, OK, I know that this makes it the manufacturer's responsibility to help pay for the cost of disposal, but why is this important to keep recycling working? What does it do? To answer that, I have to explain what happens without EPR, and that's manufacturers can create whatever they want without thinking about how to get rid of it. So a great example of that is actually K-cups. So who here has used a K-cup before? I have, yeah. So in 1998, John Sylvan created the Care Company and invented these K-cups. In 2006, this company was acquired by Green Mountain Coffee Roasters. And in 2012, the K-cup design patents expired and then the market was flooded with a bunch of new brands all creating this tiny little device called a K-cup. The K-cup has a couple problems with its management at the end of its life. What it is comprised of is the top is an aluminum foil lid, often has a layer of plastic on it. Inside, there's a mesh filter with coffee grounds, and that filter can either be made out of natural or synthetic fibers. It really just depends on who created the cup. And then surrounding the entire thing is a plastic container, often unlabeled, so you don't know what exactly the plastic is. So the first problem is that it's made up of multiple different layers of items. And as we learned earlier on, when things are made of, of multiple different material types, it becomes hard to recycle. The other problem with K-cups is they're typically smaller than two inches in size, meaning that even if you separated out the aluminum from the plastic, from the mesh filter, you still couldn't recycle the cup. Sure, you could possibly compost the filter, and if it is only aluminum on the lid, you can add it to your ball, but that cup itself will never be recyclable. So this is a great example of a company creating something where most of it is just going to be landfill trash. And current estimates are saying that K-cup use is exceeding around 10 billion globally. And I'll tell you right now, the average person who uses a K-cup, they are not going to take the time to separate out all of those layers. They're just going to take that little pod and throw it straight into the trash. And the creator of K-cups, he actually told Atlantic Magazine in 2015 that he feels sometimes bad that he ever even created it or did it because he created this invention that is just landfill waste. It's never going to be recyclable. Another example of manufacturers not thinking about disposal is something like shrink sleeve labels. So I have an example of that here on this bottle. Um, this label is made from a different type of material than what's underneath it. So the shrink sleeve labels are often PETG, whereas the bottle or container underneath can be anything. This one is HGPE number two, but there are some aluminum containers that have the shrink sleeve labels as well as steel cans. There are even glass bottles that have the shrink sleeve label. The issue with this is that when these materials move through the MRF, if they do have uh, color sorting techniques, it kind of gets confused. Um, so when it looks at this, it sees it as PETG and not what's underneath, which just increases the contamination flowing through the MRF stream. So our recommendation for if you have an item with a shrink sleeve label on it is to take an X-Acto knife or another type of knife and make a little slit on the product, remove the shrink sleeve label sleeve, throw out the sleeve, and then recycle the bottle underneath. So we show this just to show um, manufacturers, they don't currently think about recycling. They think about their product, their design, what's going to sell to consumers. Not about whether what they are making, is it going to become something new? Is it recyclable? What is it? So EPR just kind of confronts them with the fact of the disposal of their items and help share the cost of throwing things away. So I know that was a lot of information we just threw at you. So again, we're going to finish off with some takeaways, just some things that you should come away from this lesson with. Uh, we're always going to want to put in clean and dry recyclables into the blue bin. 
It's going to be mainly containers and packaging in your blue bin, nothing durable. The rule of two is a big one. All items have to be at least two inches in any two dimensions. The three Fs, we don't want any film plastic in there, we don't want any foam, and we don't want any food. We don't want any tanglers, and we don't want anything toxic or combustible in your blue bin. So, now that we went through all of that, we actually have a little quiz for you guys. So, looking at this pizza box here, uh, where do you think this goes at the end of its life? It's marginal. Yeah. It seems to have a lot of grease and some food, so I guess trash. Yeah. But you could cut off the top. Cut off the top. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, with something like this, you can cut the top off and put that in your blue bin because there's not a lot of grease on it. But for the bottom portion, it does have leftover food on it and it is pretty greasy. So that can be thrown away. If you do have a backyard compost system, you could cut up that bottom portion and put it in your bin. But if you don't backyard compost, this would just be trash. So now we're moving on to our next items. Uh, we have a glass cup here and a glass baking tray here. Trash. Trash. Okay, you guys are all right. <laughs> so yeah, this is trash. Your single use glass is absolutely okay to put in your blue bin, but anything that has an extended use, so the drinkware, stemware, any ovenware, your glass plates, bowls, all of that is not made from the same material as the single use glass, so it's therefore not recyclable. Other non-recyclable glass is things like pane glass, crystal glass, most mirrors can't go in your blue bin. So we have our last items here. We have two different types of coffee. Where do you guys think this goes? Trash. Okay, I was going trash. Yes. Uh, you could separate the others, are those cardboard? Uh, you can yeah, so that them. is a foil lined tube. Oh, it's a foil, so there's foil inside it. Trash. Yes, yeah, exactly. So both of these fall into the same trap of having multiple materials that are hard to separate in the same device. We already talked about K-cups a lot, but besides being smaller than two inches, they have multiple non-recyclable layers all put together. For the foil line cardboard rolls, they're also, if they're not able to be separated, they can't go in your blue bin. There are some foil line tubes that you can separate out the aluminum from the cardboard, but a lot of them, it's really hard to be able to do that. I say if you can get it separated, it's fine to put those two separately in your blue bin, but if you can't, it will just go in the trash. Other examples of non-recyclable foil and tubes are some things that Quaker Oats sells for your oatmeal, a lot of your crescent rolls and your nuts. Um, do we have the Pringles over there? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a great example of a foil and tube. Um, and it's a great example of how hard it can be to separate this out. So it does have the aluminum on the inside and it's an aluminum bottom, but the entire outside of this is just made of cardboard. And it's really, really hard to separate out the aluminum from the cardboard. So this at its end of life would just be trash. Um, and then I'd like to point out with this, this is not an aluminum lid. This is a type of aluminum lid that also has plastic on it. So this is a good example of two different types of materials for lids. But since this little guy is greater than two inches in any two dimensions, this can go in your boobin. Even without a number. Even without a number, um, that's why we try to move away from the numbers. Not everything has a label on it. So as long as you have the rules in your mind, if you know it's plastic and you know it's not a compostable plastic, it's safe to assume it can go in your blue bin. So basically, like just the other day, I was looking at this plastic container, and for the life of me, I couldn't find a number on it. So it went yeah. trash because I didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. So that could have gone and recycled. Yeah. I mean, it could have, but our motto is always, if you're in doubt, keep it out. It is better to throw things away than contaminate our recycling stream by putting in items that aren't recyclable. Just because it's better at the end to have a clean product coming out, because that's what actually makes the recyclers money and keeps the system working. And, and you mentioned yogurt containers. Just about yeah. every yogurt container I have is a number five. Yes, yep. and that's and absolutely okay to put in your blue bin. So you can but is that like any number five or just number five yogurt containers? Because there's number fives that aren't yogurt containers. Yeah, so number fives, if they are a plastic container or packaging, I think we have 
an example here, this takeout container. Yeah, this bottom is number five. This is perfectly okay to put in your glue bin. Okay, even though it says no number fives, you'll take number fives. We do take number fives. Okay. Um, the, I think there is confusion because the mandatory recyclables, there's number one and two for that. Right. But there's more than just the mandatory recyclables that can go in your blue bin and are accepted for recycling. It's just the number one and two that are part of the law. Okay, but there's a lot of number fives on it's like the pig's trash because it's not on the list. Yeah. Okay. A lot of a lot of the times the items that are goes by the actual type and not just the number. In my experience, half the time the number isn't even legible. Yeah. So it's just a good way to be <laughs> Uh, just to kind of keep in mind what the item is rather than what the resin code is. Um, yeah. yeah. So plastic film, um, no cell cellophane, right? Yeah, no cellophane, I, yeah. Um, that's the thing I have the biggest question about, yeah. about samples. Perfect. Oh, of course. Um, these, these are all kinds of film. Yeah, okay. So this is... Am I on TV? <laughs> so this is a bubble mailer. Um, it's just made of plastic. This is absolutely fine to go in our label included. Label, yes, you can leave on, or you can cut it out if you. I thought you had to remove. Paper. You can, yeah, you can remove That's the label. That's not paper. It's a plastic. Can or have to? There's a difference. There is a difference. Um, you don't necessarily have to, but if you leave the label on, it does add to the contamination that we send to Trex, who takes all of this. Um, so we do ask people cut it out, but if someone forgets, it's okay. But that's a plastic label. Does that make any difference? No, those are plastic. Maybe they are, but maybe they are. It's a sticker, but this bag itself is fine to go in. Um, this one, um, it's okay with. When they first started plastic film, it, if you can stretch it, yeah, yeah. it's okay. That's exactly, yeah. So with this, what you're going to want to do, um, you're just going to stretch it. And as you can see, my finger is kind of moving through it, and I can almost put a hole. Okay. That means it is most likely polyethylene, which okay. is the type of plastic that we want in that program. So it's a safe bet if you can stretch it, and it does stretch, it's acceptable. Okay, then originally we were told that liners for cereal and so forth is okay, but I don't know if this will be stretched. Um, yeah, so that's an exception for plastic bag and film. Um, cereal is okay in that program. Oh, but yeah, that one doesn't look like a normal bag. Cereal, cereal that's particularly stiff. Yeah, it doesn't look like a normal bag. Right? We can pull up our plastic bag and call cheese. I'm pretty sure cereal is exactly It actually comes that. from um, like, Swiss music. Uh, this is a normal one, and this yeah. has. This is so this is actually. Am, yeah, so we might have to update our guidelines, but as far as I'm aware, Trex does take all cereal containers. So we can actually take that question down and let you know if we're not on the internet. Uh, what about this? This is a. So usually things like that that were wrapped around food, like that was around a cheese yes. or a hot dog. Those tend to be not acceptable just because they tend to have the remnants of whatever they were wrapped around, like meat or dairy. Um, if How about made it, it's clean. No, because you, you're still not able to 100% verify that all of the germs from the food are off of that. Um, so they just ask, we don't want anything that really came in contact with meat or cheese. Well, this is um, from another cookie. Same oh. thing. Yeah, that should be, I mean, can I feel it for a second? Well, it's clearly qualified. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is absolutely it's fine. It's not 100%, I didn't lick every crumb off. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah most, I think you cover this so lid, uh, cover for a yogurt or something. Yeah, that would just be trash. Oh, um, really? Cause yeah, it's it's really, really, it No, no, this is pure plastic. It's pure plastic, but if you, um, you see how that makes a pretty loud noise? Yeah. If it's crinkly and it is a film plastic, that means it can't go in our plastic. This one doesn't either. When we yeah. when we said yogurt lids, we meant the aluminum tops that go on like yeah, yeah. yeah. those that often have plastic inside of them. They do, yeah. They so do, and that's the, what that is. For the lids, you're always going to want to make sure there is no plastic on it. If it's just aluminum, like the wee yogurt, their lids are just aluminum. That's fine. If there is a plastic layer, that would make it non-recyclable. If you tear it very slowly, you can usually see. Oh, I've done. Yeah, I've done. Yeah, we have the plastic stretching. 
good example here is this box. Um, typically, you would think, oh, maybe this is fine. But if you start tearing at it, you'll see that there is yeah. a layer of plastic, yeah, yeah. and that makes it unrecyclable. So you're thinking this is not acceptable? I'm going to double check that, because as far as I am aware, Trex accepts all types of cereal bags. But this could be an issue where manufacturers have changed what they make their cereal bags out of, and we now have to reassess our guidelines. Okay. We usually have to keep the rules general to make sure that it's mostly correct. But like I said, there's packaging that changes constantly. Oh, it does okay. change constantly. All right. There are a lot that of answers a lot of my questions. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, so, yeah. No, I was I looking at that and I went, ooh. <laughs> But so I know pretty much it's like, if you're not sure, just put it in the trash. Yeah, yeah. Basically, it's better to know that what you are recycling is recyclable. If you're unsure, don't recycle it. Hoping it'll get recycled, throw it out instead. You can always talk um, with the structure of your station as well. We answer questions about recycling all day long, uh, if it's possible. You could even email yeah. us with a picture, if that helps. Yeah, we get that sometimes. I wonder, is it, is it possible to get a printout of that resin chart? Yeah, that I can send would be it. really helpful. Yeah. Um, and I had some small print that I couldn't read on the screen, but if you printed okay. that out, I think that would be really helpful. Yeah. And many years ago, when the film program first started, one of Gabby's predecessors, um, Holly, oh. um, created a, a chart, and on the front of it, in color, was things that were acceptable in the film. Yes. Thing and things on the back of things that weren't. I don't know if you still have that somewhere. Yeah, in the that's what I'm thinking that about. That is still our current guidance for the plastic bag and film program. Well, it didn't um, look like that. We no. don't have oh, the yeah, plastic no, bag. Uh, like bring that one. Yeah. Okay. Um, what we do have is just blue bin recycling, and then our disposal guide. Um, okay. If you want. Um, we do have a sign-in sheet over here. You can always write your email down and we can send you any follow-up materials that we have available. Sure. This looks good. <laughs> but yeah, gross, um, cereal bags are on our list of acceptable items for our plastic bag and film program. Now, yeah. not to be nitpicky, but okay. <laughs> that's not <laughs> what it's or, to be. Like, uh, you know, yeah. so a, that's not. So that, that bag wouldn't be part of plastic bag and film because it's, because it's too crinkly. Okay. Yeah. Cereal bags is the one weird exception for that, where typically, even though they are crinkly, they're made of a number two or four plastic, which is what we want for the plastic bag and film program. Okay. Which gets, it is confusing. Um, that program we get a lot of questions about. But again, our motto, when in doubt, throw it out. The box for any crackers, if it's just cardboard, it can go in your move in. So, Early on, you said that um, that um, China um, it comes and goes the amount of recycling they'll accept, and yet when you have the picture of where all our things are going, yeah. none of it went to China. Yeah. Yeah. So none so, of our things go so, to China. Um, we're not so impacted by what China is doing. I mean, in, in some ways, if something big happens abroad that, let's say, impacts the value of a specific material, that could still have an effect here, yeah. even though we're not selling to that. And I'd say um, China pulled out of the United States waste management in 2017. Yeah. So we've had a couple of years here and in Canada and other countries where we've had time to develop programs for recycling. Um, and especially in Vermont, since we do have some mandated recyclables, there is a little bit of an incentive to keep it running. So we've managed to find markets for our recyclables outside of China. Um, is there concern about, um, with the new bottle bill, um, if removing the amount of recyclables you'll have? So what happens to our recycling program if that? Yeah, so that's the thing about the bottle bill. Um, the bottle bill does remove litter from roadways and streets. And um, it won't unless they raise the deposit. Yeah, I, know. I mean, <laughs> yeah, the deposit. That's right. Yeah, it doesn't work. The deposit should be thirty-five or forty cents. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's up to the legislatures right. to decide. But yeah, we don't see any of the recycling that comes if it comes to our facility, and it's it doesn't come to our facility basically if it's part of the bottle bill. That goes to a redemption center, and then the redemption center handles it. 
why those programs ex exist is to get rid of litter because uh, someone had the idea that if you pay people for commonly littered materials, then they'll stop littering it and bring it. Bottle bills do have an effect that work, but um, they don't necessarily help our markets continue to grow uh, because we don't see those materials. Well, you don't get heaven to sell. I mean, that, that, those materials are valuable. Yeah. Um, I, I had a question about the, um, the metal lids. You showed cutting out the lid and putting it inside the can. Yeah. So does that mean they should not be included loose? Yeah. So because these lids, um, they don't, they're sharp. they're sharp, one, so they can cut the workers at the MRF, and two, they also typically lay flat. Whereas like plastic lids, if they're greater than two inches, they do have like edges. Um, it can get mixed up in the MRF stream where it will act the same as a piece of paper. Because it's light material, it's flat. Um, the MRF is just basically a giant conveyor belt and it will potentially become contamination in the paper stream. So this just, if you make something one, if it's all one material and you can make it all one material like this, do it. It's kind of similar to plastic bottles, why we want to have the lids back on. It's all plastic, so it'll just move through better. I know you didn't take the paper off. Does that not matter? It doesn't necessarily matter. Um, with recycling, we're always going to expect some level of contamination in the stream. For things like that, it doesn't matter if you take it off or not. If you want to be a super pro recycler, you can take it off and throw it out. It will create a cleaner recycling product, but that's not something that we require to be blue bin recycled. But it's pure paper usually. I mean, it is, yeah. So you could take, you could take that off and paper. put it in separately if yeah. you wanted to. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, is that all the questions? Anyone has any more? Uh, <laughs> I know it's a it's lot a of information. <laughs> the Recycling center mm -hmm. over the center. I haven't been there yet. Um, can you go through it? Do you have like tours or something? Or yeah, we do. Um, it's the, it's not the um, it's not a MRF, so we don't sort recycling there um, because it's a transfer station. It's where we aggregate materials, but yeah. we do well, we do give tours. Um, we do. Yeah, and, and you are welcome to go if you're driving through. You probably won't be able to go through. The, what we call the, the tip floor, which is for trash, or the main recycling building. Um, but we do have special recycling, and we can give you a tour. Yeah, yeah. Well, just be just like drive through and see what you collect, because like yeah. plastic film, you have to collect that yourself and take it to the transfer station. Right? Yes. Same like with um, some folks that um, they're compost. Well. Kitchen waste. Yeah, they can collect that and take it to the to the transfer station. Yes. Now, are there for those two items? That's just free drop off, right? I mean, do you, or do so, you have to pay to drop that off? For food scraps, uh, there is currently a charge of a dollar up to five gallons for residents. Um, but for most special recycling um, or special materials. This pamphlet here, um, these are the programs that are covered by the EPR laws, so it makes it free for oh, you to okay. dispose of it. We do have um, some special materials programs that are outside of this. Um, so we do have a guide online called our A to Z guide, and this goes through items, list alphabetically, and where you can bring them. Or if you have questions, you can always call us um, at the district transfer station. We are more than happy to tell you what we accept. Okay. Right, that's yeah. good. So but I, I guess I, I should listen to your website first. Yeah, we're here. Oh, I didn't get one. I just didn't get the chance to read the whole thing. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Things like textiles are free. Um, yeah, textiles that are, are not free. included in there. But all batteries are free. Is paper shredding uh, free? I don't know. I think, yes. Paper shredding might be free. Uh, uh, plastic bag and film is free. Scrap metal is free. We have a lot of free programs. Light bulbs. Yeah. Light bulbs up to 10. Per day, <laughs> it's I know it gets complicated. But <laughs> light bulbs are uh, the mercury-containing ones are covered under Vermont state law.